Well, welcome to day six of our 31 days in the book of Proverbs. So for 31 days, we're going to look at the 31 chapters of wisdom that come from this book. Today is day six, so we will look at chapter six. I encourage you to always read this proverb of the day before uh, watching the video. and Kind of let the text uh, speak to you and uh, see if we find some agreement on some things. Uh, let me get there, Proverbs 6. There's a lot in this proverb. It uh, um, kind of jumps around a little bit. It might seem a little disjointed with the topics that it covers. But it starts with this idea of um, w- this warning of, uh, of co-signing, right? And with great urgency does he tell with instruction, you know, to, to get yourself out of these agreements that you've made by by co-signing or getting into a business deal uh, with a stranger. We know the New Testament tells us that, uh, you know, the borrower is slave to the lender. And um, if we can help somebody, we should just help them. Um, If we have something we can give them, to just give it to them um, rather than loan it to them or help them borrow. So we see that in the first five verses of Proverbs chapter 6. And then we go to verses 6 through 11, and this is really a warning against laziness. And it's interesting, you know, if you do observation as you're reading through scripture and just kind of pick up on different words, you'll you'll see as you kind of train your eyes to this, uh, things will kind of come off the page, you you know, that you might have missed previously. And for me, in verses 6 through 11, it was the list in chapter 10 or verse 10 about a little sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands. Um, Because I think that this plays into kind of our humanness that that we think, well, our intentions are just a little more, just a little more sleep, a little more slumber, a little more folding of the hands, right, of just kind of hanging out, a little more Netflix, one more episode of this show, you know, just a few more minutes here, and then I'll get to what I need to do. And the reality is that time is getting away from us. And a little, uh, though we may believe that's what it's going to be, turns into a lot. And the warning is, is that poverty will pounce on us like a, like a band. And they use the illustration of ants, how they're so busy working all the time. You never see ants just resting. But in the winter, they have what they need uh, to get through that season. So this warning against laziness. And then we get to verse 12 and, and through 15. And this is really interesting because it gives the characteristics of what the writer says are worthless and wicked people. Like, here's what they look like. Here's the definition. And again, if you just look at the words and the grammar that they use, he's, he's using physical you know, parts of a body here at the beginning. I picked this up first in verses 16 through 19. And then when I went back and read it again, I saw it in verses 12 through 15. But listen to what he says. He says, um, what are worthless and wicked people like? They're constant liars, right? Talking about the words we speak, signaling their deceit with the wink of an eye, a nudge of the foot, uh, a wiggle of the finger. Their perverted hearts plot evil. They constantly stir up trouble, but they will be destroyed suddenly, broken in an instant, beyond all hope of healing. So he gives these physical characteristics of of what wicked uh, and worthless people, as he uses, are like. They're constant liars. Their mouth uh, can't tell the truth. Their motions, deceitful wink of an eye, just a wink of an eye, a nudge of a foot, the wiggle of a finger, those are normal actions. But what he's pointing out is is they're, they're not normal to actions to worthless and wicked people. They have intention behind them to deceit, to 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 lie. And then he talks about a perverted heart, plots evil, right? Plans evil. He doesn't say that wicked people uh um you know they 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 execute on perverted uh uh plans on plans from their perverted heart, but that they that they plan them. Um not even commit, but that the planning is what can make us wicked. And then constantly stirring up trouble, right? These people that are just, you know, nonstop, constantly. You know, we get this word picture of stirring. We know these people that kind of stir. We tell them, hey, you're stirring the pot, right? Just trying to get things agitated and aggravated. And then he gives the outcome of what happens, right? They'll be destroyed suddenly, broken in an instant, beyond all hope of healing, right? They're going to be destroyed. We talked about this in day five, that this is where the road uh, of the wicked leads to, to death, uh, to, to suffering in this life internally, oftentimes externally as well, um, as effects of our sin, but ultimately uh, leads to death. Then we get to verses 16 through 19, and this is interesting, uh, you know, verses that they, these are, the writer writes, these are six things the Lord hates. No, wait, there's actually seven, right? So there's six, no, there's seven. 
And if you list them out, if you write them out, this is what they are. It's haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, false witness who's pouring out lies, and a person who sows discord in a family. Again, I noticed the body parts, the, the, the language here of him describing the kind of the physical appearance of a person, right? Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that kill, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, and then kind of the motivation of someone who's this false witness. And then again, this person who discord, sows discord, right? This person who's constantly stirring up trouble, breaking unity. So when I listed those seven, because I saw the list and I wrote them out, then I, I started to think about it a little bit. And I encourage you to do this, kind of let your mind wander in the text. But um, I started to think about, well, if these are the things God, God hates, then then the opposite would be something that he would love, right? And you may not agree with my list. You may have some of your own words. But if God hates um, uh, haughty eyes, right, this is proud eyes, then he loves humility. If God hates a lying tongue, then he loves truth. If God hates hands that kill the innocent, not just hands that kill, right, that's murder. But he, the writer adds, kills the innocent, Um so that there's this group, right? So if, if God hates, you know, people whose hands kill the innocent, then then I believe that he loves justice. Um, if God hates a heart that plots evil, again, doesn't, doesn't say they committed it, but they plotted it, they planned it. If God hates a heart that plots evil, then, then I believe that he loves purity. If God hates feet that race to do wrong, then God loves righteousness. If God hates false witnesses that pour out lies, then God loves mercy because a false witness, think about you're in a court, uh, you're in a trial, and somebody gets up, um, perjures themselves, right, takes an oath, but then lies, a false witness lying against somebody. So wanting to see somebody be judged and punished for something that they may not have done and our lies uh, are intended to see them be punished for something what they may not have done. So if that's the, if that's what God hates, then God loves mercy. And that's where we withhold punishment from somebody who deserves it rather than trying to put punishment on somebody who doesn't. And then a person who sows discord in a family or among the brethren, as some translations say, if God hates somebody who sows discord, then that tells me that God loves unity and peace. And this is the characteristics of some of them of, of who God is. So when I got to 16 through 19, I really stayed here for a while in my own study. And, and I encourage you to do that stuff, to kind of let the text take you where it's going to take you and, and go beyond the text. If you see things like this, um, you know, maybe this would take you to the Beatitudes in, in Matthew chapter five, because there's a list of, of, of uh, you know, of people as well. And then in verses 20 through 23, he again, and we've seen this in the previous Proverbs, he's really exhorting him to obey the, the commands, my son, this parental relationship. Don't neglect your mother's instruction. And then again, he, he talks about keeping them, you know, this truth in your heart, right? Not physical heart, figurative heart, the seat of our passions, of our desires. And then he says, wear them around your neck. And he said this before in, in earlier Proverbs. I thought about the first time I got a necklace as a kid in elementary school and, you know, had a little charm on and how excited I was to wear it outside of my shirt. You know, you want everybody to see it and you took care of it, something you were proud of. And here the writer is telling us that we need to take the our father's commands and our mother's instructions and wear them, tie them around our neck, right? Those, those things didn't get lost, right? They, they stayed. Um, and then he talks about, the, the protection that we get from, from this counsel, from wisdom. He says, when you sleep, it'll protect you. It'll lead you. When you wake up, they will advise you. And then he talks about the command is a lamp. So there's this enlightenment that, that darkness is removed, that we can see there's clarity. There's instruction, verse 23, and in, in, their instruction is a light, right? And their uh, corrective discipline is the way to life, that this, this wisdom that we're taught is something to be embraced, to hold on to, because it's guiding, it's leading, it's protecting it's enlightening and it's correcting us. And then in verse 24, through the balance of this chapter through 35, he goes back to this immoral woman talking about the dangers of sexual immorality, which he really talked a lot about in Proverbs chapter 5. So I don't want to go into it anymore beyond this other than to, to read it because it's important and it's a great temptation uh, for many of us. But he, he talks about a man who sleeps with another man's wife. And I'm, and I'm wondering as he's writing this King Solomon is, is he writing so much about sexual immorality because of his father? 
because his father had an affair with their neighbor, and then to cover up the sin of the pregnancy out of wedlock, he had her husband killed. You know, and, and that, what kind of weight did this have on a son to know that his father had done something like this? Though David was made right with God, he confessed his sins, and, and God said that David was a man after his own heart. Um, but still, just to have that, you know, on your family, what's the weight on on King Solomon here? Is it is it a little heavier than some of the other stuff? Is that why he revisits it? I don't know. But I would think you'd have to have something to do with that as a son, thinking about his father. So I encourage you, read the text, explore it, let your mind wander a little bit, uh, dig in, uncover, move around the text. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, uh, day seven, chapter seven. Thanks.